Good morning. What was that? Thank you. Any other languages you want to learn? Not many gospel church, are we? No. Okay. Those are short. Good to see all of you here. I know we're missing a few, but I think that's going to be our norm for a little while. But I'm glad you can make it out. And trust you're ready to enjoy being in church and worshiping the Lord. And I'm so glad we so glad we have church to come to. Let's start with a word of prayer. Let's see. Dean open and Myers, so open some prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again today to thank you, praise you, most of all, for who you are. And as we think of this Christmas season, it just brings to mind the salvation that you brought to us, the work of not just you, but it can come down to each individual. We just pray, Lord, that you can do this holiday season, that you shine brighter than you ever shined before, even during this dark time. We pray, Lord, that we can be with our service, be with the pastors to bring some message. It'd be easy for him to deliver and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Okay, grab a hymnal. Let's turn first to number 192. 192. Thank you. 
be one of the shepherds and suddenly you have the angels singing. Well, not singing, but declaring or whatever scripture exactly says. I've been, I've been really cool to see an angel choir. Someday we'll get to see that. Who wants to be first to get the Lord order praise this morning? Those situations seem to be coming closer and more often here lately. Like things we can't seem to work through. At least that's the case for me. I mean, maybe a few of us are landing at it, I don't know. Instructions on how to use different types of tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll let you know how that works. 3M Company. Probably, I should probably just get stock in that company because <laughs> I heard this. Just call him a guy. Yeah. Whenever something metal gets taped, that looks like an out, like a plug. And I know this is going towards the outlet. I, I give warnings. You do not plug that into the wall. <laughs> Come close every once in a while. But <clears throat> How does that tape go? Did you like that sound? <laughs> that was scotch tape. Duct tape makes a different sound. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Any prayer requests this morning? Dean? Praise the Lord just for health and strength through this year. Uh, yep. It'll almost do another year. And, you know, if we say so, and yet thank the Lord for the health he's given us. Yeah, for sure. The prayer request this morning. Kind of a praise and prayer request. Um, I did have the opportunity to travel to the Bronx two weekends ago. The praise would be that it is relatively undeterred. Um, the one thing that, um, if you haven't traveled there, outside of Manhattan, when you when you talk about the Bronx and Brooklyn, they're very much community-based places where the mom and pop shops are how you survive. And I am happy to report that when I was up there, they are open and operating and fully functional. Um, so it was great to see that. The prayer request comes to the fact that although some things have shut down and slowed down, the need of the people there has not. There are more people on the streets, more people in need of food and blankets, um, things like that. So the need has greatly increased, and obviously the workers have greatly decreased as you're not allowed to have volunteers and work groups, but we are going to start trying to work back into that. So great to see that the people are still quote unquote thriving and living their lives, but definitely some prayer requests for the needs that have been greatly increased in the city. Any idea when you're going there? Permanently, hopefully by mid-January. I'll be going up different weekends between now and then. Anybody else? Sandy Hissong's brother, Rodney Stafford. Oh, that 
That's who that is. And that's COVID. And they said this morning you put him on a ventilator. So Hold up. I didn't know who that was. Requesting prayer for his brother. Monica? I had put on a prayer request for my niece, Kelly Jensen. Her husband is a pastor in Ohio. And I talked <coughs> to her mother, who's my sister in law, last night. And she said that they're connected to some kind of global prayer chain. So she said people all over the world are praying yeah, cool. for them. And there's different situations already that are really positive. The power of prayer is amazing. And then hearing people all over, I just that's just incredible. Especially when you're the one being prayed for. It's just really powerful. There's a gentleman that they know that he actually sold the church, the property, however many years ago, and he does a big uh, fundraiser for cancer every year because his first wife died of cancer. Mm -hmm. And he called my niece and her husband and said, if you need anything, give us a call. And, they've had, and then he calls like that. So the Lord is really working in this situation. Pray for this family. Jesus, how old is she? 59. That's your niece. That's my niece. So Yeah. Well, my husband's sister was 16 when he was born. So the family was kind of spread. I was just kind of trying to figure out, does that make you really old to have a niece at 69? Or are you just... Really yeah. My niece is 59. You're older. <laughs> that in there. Susie? Uh, Steve's sister and husband are going to go to Thailand for this to be missionaries, but they're going to be living on the street. They're leaving next month. Just pray for them. All right. Well, I think we all have people that are struggling close to us, whether it's personal or friends or family or exposure or whatever that are connected to this whole mess that we're in. And we just need to pray that this um, the Lord calms this down soon. I guess it was pretty clear that the election didn't have anything to do with the virus because it didn't stop the day after. So I guess we had that answer. But he's not Right. Well, that's true. He did wait a little bit. We have all kinds of solutions for the problem, but I tell you what, I know who does have the solution. All right, if we're all done. Let's go to prayer. Oh, thank you so much that we can come to you. That we have this incredible avenue called prayer that we can talk to you as a one on one, as a personal friend. We've made that way clear. Lord, we just praise you for our church and we have this, this privilege of being in your house that we can worship you and we just thank you for that. Help us not to take this for granted. Help us to really um, make it a meaningful time because we do not know when that could be stopped. And, and we don't we don't realize there are some that don't have this privilege and just thank you that we do. Be with our church family and the different ones that are struggling, whether they have the virus or they're or quarantined or they're you know, some that is. Would you just be with them and really give a special touch? Um, I think of Sandy's brother that's struggling, especially this morning. Would you give him a special physical touch? Be with Al and Darlene and Bill and Ruth and Horners and Tim and Glenda and, and Peggy and um, the other widows that are home this morning. I think of Martha and, and Mary Jane and, and uh, Louisa. Just give them all a special touch of your presence, physical touch. Um, give them your peace. <coughs> strengthen them. <coughs> Think of Sabrina as she's working towards this uh, trip to New York and working towards this mission work. Would you help her give direction and help the people there, the struggle they're going through? We can't imagine because we live in a more isolated area, but that's such a, a dense populated area that's a whole different scenario. Just be with those people and help her as she's working, going to be working there. Be with Monica's niece and their family, the struggle that they're facing. Give a special touch of your presence and peace. And help Steve's sisters and families are going to um, be missionaries. Lord, give, give them safety and, and uh, 
Help them to be a ministry for you. Help us this time of year, Lord. It seems like there's so much craziness going on that we um, can get distracted, but help it to help this situation to force us to focus on you, focus on the true meaning of the season, and help us to bless your name through it. Bless the rest of the service in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Remember, there is no church tonight. We switch things up this week, and I put it through the prayer chain. Um, we are going to have a candle night, candlelight service next Sunday night. Brian was um, going to be really upset if we didn't. Um, now, that's something I really look forward to, and I wasn't sure how it's going to work. But we're going to try to do it and maybe just spread out a little bit farther. But um, we're going to do that next Sunday night. I'm not sure the format yet, but we'll figure that out. Um, next Sunday morning is our Christmas program. The children are putting on the Christmas program, so the service is going to be in the gym. I believe Sunday school and everything else is up here, but we'll be going to the gym then for the program and for the service. So keep that in mind. And we're still doing candy making, right? Yeah. Candy making this Friday night and uh, starting at 5-ish. And come out and help with that. And there will be no Wednesday services the 23rd and the 30th, which is Christmas Eve Eve and New Year's Eve Eve. So. <laughs> um, possibly none this Wednesday either, depending on what the snow, what the snow does. I heard there's some snow coming. So. Somehow you like snow, don't you? Oh my. That's true. You have that little Fiat that couldn't get through a mud puddle. <laughs> Anyway, we'll see how things go this week, but um, might have a white Christmas, who knows. Any announcements I'm missing? All right, grab a hymn and we'll sing another song. Turn this be to number 179, 179. Christmas isn't only the time to worship the newborn king. I think there are many questions being asked this year. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
a lot of unanswered questions, really. When will this all end? You know, what, what's the future going to look like? Um, scary question like, will I lose someone that's close to me? And, you know, the list goes on and on of all the questions that people are probably asking. But I think the one big question that probably many people are asking is, does God care? And why doesn't he do something about this? I would like you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. You're like, how is that a Christmas passage? I guess you'll find out. I found this file in, in, my, in my potential Christmas sermon ideas folder in my computer. And just really felt like it was appropriate for right now. And let's be honest, I think we probably all have similar questions to what I asked here a moment ago. Um, the difference is, like I said last week, we, we that know Jesus shouldn't need to be afraid because he's on our side. But we're still facing a lot of uncertainty. And I'm not going to lie. I, this week I've been feeling pretty blue. I hope it doesn't mean I'm going to have a blue Christmas, but this whole situation is getting old. Um, and I think, I feel like we're all in the same boat. We, we have questions that we don't have answers for. I know at least someone said there that there's a situation they just can't seem to work through. Um, we likely aren't going to find answers to these questions. But I want to pose to you three questions that we should ask ourselves. And it should be very encouraging, especially if we know Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 opens up with John explaining why he was writing and to whom he was writing. And, and he also is, is explaining who gave him this message to write. And he briefly describes Jesus in verses 4 through 6. But I just want to focus on verse 5, because in verse 5, the questions that I'm going to ask... Verse 5 gives the answers to. So look with me, and then please keep your Bibles open to Revelation 1 5, because we're going to be using that, and I'm not going to have you turn anywhere else. Revelation 1 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. One never knows how a baby is going to turn out, what they're going to grow up to be. I mean, we know if a girl is going to grow up to be a woman and a boy. I mean, that's typically the way things work, but these days there's some confusion on that. Um, but parents try their best to raise their children so they'll be a, a uh, asset and a, and a help and a blessing to society rather than a burden. A Lewis and Clara likely did not know that their little boy Adolf would turn out the way he did. And his last name was Hitler. Glenn and Grace Hefner probably didn't train their son Yu to enter into the line of business that has caused so much moral destruction and turmoil in our society. And he came up with the Playboy line, in case you didn't know that. Do you think that Susanna and Robert trained their little boy to go against the Bible and teach that God didn't create the world? Their little boy's name was Charles Darwin. But think about uh, Thomas and Nancy. They raised their little boy in Illinois, and uh, they probably never dreamed that little honest Abe would grow up to be the one of the most famous presidents during the bloodiest time in our nation's history. What about Sarah and Stephen Barton? They think that their little girl, Clara, would grow up and found the Red Cross. Or William Franklin Sr. and Morrow Graham. I'm sure you know what their boy's name was. Did they teach him to be a famous preacher? Did they show him how to do it? Or were they responsible for his influence on, to, for Christ? What I'm saying is we don't know what our children are going to turn out like. We have high hopes for that. And those of us that are... Parents are training and working with our children, and sometimes we feel like, man, it's a lost cause. 
And sometimes we're really pleased with the progress, and you know, it's up and down. And that all happens in five minutes, usually. Um, we can't force our children to do anything they don't want to do. Or can we? I'm not working on that. Um, but we can't force them to turn out a certain way. Think about Mary and Joseph. They were told by angels what their little boy was going to be and what he was going to do and what he was going to accomplish. But do you think they spent time thinking about that? Did they spend time wondering how that was going to play out? Luke 2.19 tells us that after the shepherds came to visit Mary and Joseph, and, and no doubt they shared with Mary what the angels told them, it says that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. There was certainly a lot to think about, such as, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. A sword will pierce your own soul also. Mary had a lot to think about. The last verse of Mark Lowry is really beautiful. Mary, did you know one of my favorite Christmas songs? I have all kinds of favorite songs, so it doesn't mean much. But it poses the question this way. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. And there's a Christmas song that's being sung, and I love it. It's called Welcome to This World You Made. I don't know if you've heard that. That's incredible. You think about the baby was born in a manger created the world he just entered. When a child was born, we don't know how they're going to turn out. But this baby boy in Bethlehem turned out to be the savior of the world. What an incredible birth that was. So I want to read again our text as we, as we go into asking these three questions. And follow with me again. Revelation 1.5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So there's, a, there's a threefold picture found in this one verse. Provides the answers to three questions. And the questions are, can I trust him? Does he have the power to help me? Will he take care of my future? <clears throat> so I want to start with, can I trust him? There is an incredible amount of false information being shared today. It's insane the amount of false information being shared today. It's getting very hard to trust anyone or anything. About half of the Facebook posts I see have a little censored tag on them saying that this information has been proven false by whatever independent fact checkers, and you don't even know if the fact checkers are right or you don't know what to believe. And I've really been at the place recently where I just scroll past all that stuff. Any news article, just scroll past it. Because I'm sick of people claiming that they have an edge on the truth and everyone else is wrong. And then the people that are sa they're saying is wrong, they say they're right and the other people are wrong. It's a shame, really, because what is happening is in our society, we're being conditioned to not trust at all. And that's what's happening. We don't trust anything. We don't trust anyone. What happens is simply one saying, here's my word. You can go to the bank with it and trust that. Not anymore. So amid all the chaos and the lack of trust, there is one question that we need to ask. We that believe in Jesus and it should be a reminder to us. But I also feel there are some that are asking this question that genuinely don't know the answer. And the question is, can I trust Jesus? Just about all of us here, I think pretty much all of us here, have grown up with a church background. Many of us, if not most of us, have grown up with Christian parents. We have heard the name of Jesus so many times, it's, it's become second nature. We've become so used to having Jesus as part of our lives. But have we ever really stopped to ask ourselves the question, do I trust Jesus? And here's where John's words in the verse we read in our text can be applied. The first phrase of that verse describes Jesus as the faithful witness. In a court of law, a faithful witness is one who you can trust, 
They're going to be honest with their, with their uh, testimony. They can be relied upon when they're called upon. They are faithful. They're trustworthy. So when John calls Jesus the faithful witness, he means the faithful witness. There's only one that can have that high of a, of a description, and that's Jesus Christ. He is always faithful, and what he says is always true. doesn't matter how many fact-checkers dig into it, and I'd just love to see how many fact-checkers, what they do with the Bible, and if they go through the whole thing. You know, Jesus created the world in six days. This has been this is proved false. He made a world that the flood's false, you know. Jesus' words are always true. 1 Timothy 6.13 states that Jesus witnessed the good confession before Pilate. And what did Jesus say when he stood before Pilate? For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's the truth. Jesus is, a, is the supreme giver of truth. And, he, and those who really want to find the truth should pay attention to what he says. See, this is where it's getting hard. There are so many that claim to know the truth. But is it the truth? Or is it their version of what they think is true? And I'm not trying to, to boast or bring glory to myself or anything of that nature, but I've been so frustrated with all this truth sharing that's going on today that I've determined the only truth I'm going to share, especially from the pulpit, is only going to come from God's Word. Because I know that can be trusted without a doubt. Writing several hundred years ago, one commentator said that the word faithful or the title faithful witness means four things. And listen to these. What God said, Christ made known. He taught without regards to the words of men. In other words, he didn't care what people thought of him. He was faithful even in death. And he will reveal the truth in the end. And that last statement I hang on to. Because there are th times when things get tough. Maybe I'm accused falsely or, or something is going on. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what to believe. But I know without a doubt that in the end, the truth will come out because Jesus will reveal it. John Watson said, no one has yet discovered the word Jesus ought to have said. None suggested the better word he might have said. No action of his has shocked our moral sense. None has fallen short of the ideal. He is full of surprises, but they are all surprises of perfection. In other words, no one came up with anything better that he should have said or could have said or could have done because he did it all right. Everyone has to reconcile in their own heart if they can trust Jesus. And until this issue is settled, there is no moving forward spiritually. Many years ago, Bob Harrington, the chaplain of Bourbon Street, and Madeline Murray O'Hare, the famous atheist, had a debate on the Donahue TV program. At one point, someone in the audience asked Mrs. O'Hare what she was going to do when Jesus returned. What would she say to them? With great confidence, she declared, it won't happen, so I don't have to worry about that. To which Bob Harrington replied, The Bible contains 318 verses that speak of the return of Christ. She just said he isn't going to return. Over here, you've got 318 verses in the book of God. And over there, you have one verse from the book of O'Hare. Now, who are you going to believe? And that's a key question. Who are you going to believe? It's getting harder and harder to dif differentiate between truth and lies because it's such a mess right now. It seems like all we're being fed is lies. But I can stand here without a doubt and tell you that what Jesus says can be trusted. With no questions. Can he be trusted with this whole crazy thing we're facing right now, we're living in? Yeah, I believe he can. Can he be trusted to give strength through personal crisis, whether it's family-related or health-related or even spiritual? Yeah, I think so, too. And I know it's easy to say in another, another totally different story to live out, but I think, 
as I was preparing this, the words to the song the Collingworth family sings and um, our group sang at one time, I can trust Jesus. It really states how our trust in him should grow. Now I just want to read it to you. God picked up a sparrow that could no longer fly. He brushed off its wounds and watched it soar into the sky. If he's mindful of creation, on this I can depend. I am his child, and I can place all my trust in him. I have prayed some prayers and felt they were never heard. But I held to God's hand and kept right on trusting in his words. My wants and God's desires don't always agree. But I lean on his will, for he knows what's best for me. I can trust Jesus. I can trust Jesus. He never once has failed to meet my needs. He is my strong tower, the strength in my weakest hour. I can trust Jesus. He always takes care of me. And that's something we learn as we grow. So, can we trust Jesus? Yes, because he is the faithful witness. So the second question we need to ask, does he have the power to help me? I mean, if we really want to seek to know if we can trust Jesus, then we'll naturally want to know, does he have the power to help me? There's so many challenges that life poses. Does Jesus have the power to help us? And the answer is found in the second phrase of our key verse today. John states in the second phrase, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Okay, it's not firstborn of the dead, firstborn from the dead. And this refers to his resurrection from the dead. When he rose from the dead, he became the firstborn from the dead. And what exactly does that mean? It means he's the first person who ever rose from the dead, never to die again. Okay, think about that. During his earthly ministry, Jesus raised several people from the dead, including Lazarus. He'd been dead for four days. Each one of these events was an incredible miracle, but each one of these people died again. Okay? Jesus never did. When he came out of the tomb, he rose once and for all. He left the grave for good. Jesus being the firstborn from the dead means that he is the first in a long line of people who will be raised from the dead never to die again. And that's referring to the rapture, when the dead in Christ rise. Now there's great comfort to be found here because, just think about this, if Jesus came to take control of death and the grave, he came to take the keys of death from Satan. I've done quite a few funerals now, and I've been a part of them and attended quite a few, and it's always a sad time. It's especially sad when you know that the person that is deceased was not a believer. If it's a funeral for a person that was a believer and knew Jesus Christ as their personal friend, it was still sad, but there was hope because we're told in Scripture that person will not be dead forever. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. It's that simple. If we believe, we will live forever. It's as hard as you want to make it. And unfortunately, things are way too, people make it way too complicated. And even though we can't grasp the magnitude of it, and we never will probably until we get to heaven, but we can trust him because he speaks the truth. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about Jesus conquering death and how through him we can live forever. But what about the question, can I trust him with my future? How does that apply? Well, think about it. If he can conquer death, I'm sorry, does he have the power to help me? I jumped ahead. Does he have the power to help me? If he can conquer death, he can do anything. That's powerful. He absolutely has the power to see us through whatever we're facing. And I realize sometimes these burdens get heavy, and I'm speaking for myself because I know that sometimes it's like, okay, what's going on here? But I know that Jesus is strong enough and powerful enough to help us through. So does he have the power to help us? Yes, because he is the firstborn from the dead. 
And then that leads us to our final question that I jumped ahead a minute ago. Will he take care of my future? <clears throat> well, okay, so we decide he can be trusted, and I suppose he does have the power to help me, but can he take care of the future? For me, I don't like talking about the future. That's not my cup of tea. Ask my wife. I tell her all the time, we're getting through today. We're not planning out Christmas of 2024 or our vacation in 2039. We're getting through today. For many, the future is a scary subject. And I can relate to that because my personality is I, I'm concerned about the future. What, what might it look like? The deal is I have Jesus on my side, and I don't need to be afraid of the future. But what about those that don't know Jesus? The future's scary. So back to our question, can he take care of my future? And the answer comes in John's final title for Jesus Christ. It is, it is breathtaking, the, the scope of it. He calls Jesus the ruler over the kings of the earth. The word ruler means he is the ultimate authority over all of the kings of the earth. They are great, but he's greater. They are mighty, but he is mightier. Millions answer to them. But they all answer to him. He is not merely one of the kings. He is the ruler of all of them. It doesn't matter who takes up residence in the White House or who sits on the throne in England. They're subject to him and his supreme rule. So if the guy you wanted or you feel needs to get in as president doesn't get there, the new guy's still under his rule. We can take comfort in that. In the first century, the mighty emperor Nero thought he was the ruler of the kings of the earth. He held in his hands the power of life and death. Thumbs up, one man lived. Thumbs down, one man died. And that's referring to the gladiator games. Bloody, bloody, disgusting events that happened in the Colosseum. And it is said that he ordered the burning of Rome and then blamed it on the early Christians. He had Paul the Apostle beheaded and thinking that the pernicious Christian movement would then die with him. But 2,000 years have passed, and the tables have turned. We now call our dogs Nero, and our sons Paul. I think that's pretty good. Who are these rulers that John is talking about? Political leaders, various capacities, like mayors and councilmen, chairmen, governors, congressmen, senators, presidents, prime ministers, and the list goes on and on. In reality, they're just small-time leaders of little empires and compared compared to the vast universe that our savior rules and is in charge of jesus is the supreme leader but it would seem that by looking on the world we live in that that's not the case there are great atrocities going unpunished pornographers go free baby killers are untouched and we see politicians breaking laws that they made drug dealers are still making their billions and all the nations arm themselves for great destruction. Rioters destroy livelihoods because they feel like if they do, they'll somehow be hurt better and, and they're not punished for it. And I'll just throw this one in here. There are even a few that insist on going to Walmart without a mask. <laughs> and that's pretty rough. But all the evidence today seems to point to the fact that Satan is on the throne. That he's in charge. But he's only been given the power that's been allowed him, that he's allowed to have. It only looks that way because that's God's plan for now. There will come a day when Jesus Christ will step forward on the stage of history and say enough is enough. The hands that were nailed to the cross will stretch out and take control in an incredibly mighty way. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about, where we took our key verse from. So can Jesus take care of my future? Yeah, he can because he's taking care of the future of the whole world. And he rules not only the world, but the entire universe that we know and even what we don't know. And if you want to find out some interesting things, just Google the known universe and find out what is out there that we don't even know about. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Do you look around and wonder what might the future look like? with all the chaos that's surrounding us, can Jesus take care of it? Yes, because he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. 
See, looking on as a casual onlooker on that first night in Bethlehem, that little baby that was born didn't really happen. It's not impressive. How's he going to accomplish all of this? He was just a baby. How can he do all these miracles? But he sure surprised everyone, didn't he? And he's not done. The last phrase in our key verse, and I want you to look at that, is just beautiful. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Can I trust him? Does he have the power to help me? Will he take care of my future? Yes, because he loves us and washed us in his blood. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came to die in our place. So grip fast to Christ this Christmas time. Because there are some days that's just about all we can hold on to. But he's a sure anchor. We're in good hands, and not with all states. But we're in good hands with the hands that hold the world. And the ones that were also nailed to a cross. So joy to the world. The Lord has come. I trust those three questions are an encouragement to you. Because I wonder as time goes on, will the questions continue to mount? Will things continue to get worse? Will they get better? We don't know. But we know we can trust Jesus. And I'm so incredibly grateful for the baby that was born in a manger. Because of him, I can live in heaven. And that's my promise. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the incredible, incredible gift you gave us. Thank you for the meaning of the season. And help us to focus on that and realize that you can take care of us and, and, you, and you are trustworthy and, and you know what's going to happen in our future. And you have all the power. You are in charge of everything. Help us to lean on that and trust you with it. Bless each person here, those that are watching. Give them a special touch of encouragement through this holiday season. In your name we pray. Amen.